Hello, everyone, and welcome to the December edition of Astronomy on Tap Santa Cruz. We're so happy to have you all joining us this evening. Um, yeah, I hope that you're ready to hear some really exciting stuff about black holes from two of UC Santa Cruz uh, Astronomy Department grad students, Sierra and Brenna. They're so excited to be here with us tonight to share a bit about their research and their expertise on, on mysterious, mysterious black holes. Um, so I've, I hope that you've got something to sip on. Um, my name is Alex. I tend to forget to introduce myself during these things. I, I feel like I already know you all so well. <laughs> um, I'm also a graduate student at UCSC and really excited to be here this evening with you all. So first to get started, we're going to um, invite on Bob Kibrick, who is joining us from UCL, University of California Observatories. Um, to talk a bit about his tenure at UCO, as well as some of the wildfire relief efforts uh, that are taking place in order to support Lick Observatory. So welcome, Bob, how are you this evening? Very good, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So um, I see that you have had quite a long career at UCO, so, um, doing a lot of development for Keck and Lick Observatory and all of these really well-known uh, observatories across the, the world, really. So, um, yeah. Um, how was that experience? How did you get into UCO? What brought you here to begin with? And, and what has kept you here over, over this long career? Well, well, I'll start with the last part. What has kept me here is just the phenomenal people who make up uh, UCO, um, you know, the, the faculty, the graduate students, the technical staff are just all top notch and incredible people to work with both for their skill and, and just what really wonderful, decent, uh, caring people they are. So, um, that, that, that's what kept me here for Sydney. I'm, I'm fortunate. Most people don't have the option of, of staying in, in one, uh, job or, or um, you know, for, for their entire lifetime. And uh, I consider myself very lucky uh, to have been in that position. Yeah, that's wonderful. Nice. So, um, yeah, what sort of work are you doing now with Friends of Lick Observatory? And, um, I know that you helped to found this organization. So tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Uh, I uh, officially retired in 2012, although uh, academics never really retire <laughs> completely. But that's also the year that we, uh, my wife and I, uh, sort of spearheaded the founding of the Friends of Lake Observatory. Um, it's chartered as a UC Santa Cruz Friends Group. And we had been members of a number of UCSC Friends Groups for years, Friends of the Farm and Garden, uh, farm uh, friends of the Arboretum, friends of the Long Marine Lab. I yeah. mean, they're, Friends of Lake Observatory is a bit unique in that we're the only UCSC friends group that is aff affiliated with a, um, a facility that's not either on the UCSC campus or in uh, the Santa Cruz area. Hmm. So a, a lot of our members uh, or not only in Santa Cruz, but throughout the Bay Area. And we even have members in other states and a few in, in other countries. Wow, that's very cool, very cool. Yeah, so tell us a bit more as well about the wildfire relief. We know that the uh, wildfires um, a few months ago were having a pretty big effect and, and had damaged some of the domes on Mount Hamilton, is that correct? Uh, the dome is fortunately okay. I'm, I'm okay. wondering, would this be a good time for me to go yeah. to my slides? Please, yeah. Okay. So let, let me do that. Um, okay, share screen. There we go. All right, so just uh, a little bit of introduction for those who don't know too much about Lick Observatory. 
it's been one of UC's uh, premier scientific institutions since it was founded 132 years ago. It's responsible for many uh, important scientific discoveries and has played a leading role in the development of new technologies such as the laser guide star adaptive optics, which you see here in the right, the laser beam going into the sky, a technology that's really revolutionized ground-based astronomy. And we support research of astronomers, postdocs, and graduate students throughout the UC system. Over here on the left is the historic 36 inch refractor that went into operation at Lick in 1888. So LEC complements the capabilities of the Keck Observatory in, in that we support observing programs that require long-term monitoring of moderately bright targets. It enables graduate students, such as the one shown here, to uh, develop their design and conduct their own observing programs, and in this case, build their own instrument. This is an interferometer. Um, and it also provides a fantastic site as a test bed for new instruments and technologies. So in normal years, LIC provides highly popular public events and, and it attracts 10,000, tens of thousands of visitors every year. It's a, a major attraction in the Bay Area, but <clears throat> unfortunately due to the coronavirus pandemic, the observatory has been closed to the public for most of this year and that will likely continue well into 2021. So in August, uh, there was the SCU lightning complex fire, which was one of, oh, something like, you know, eight or 10 different major fires throughout California. We had 4 million acres burn in California this year, just an incredible record. And it burned, you can see this is from our, uh, on the left, this is a nighttime image from our popular ham cam web camera looking to the east and you see fire all around the observatory. Um, the fire actually burned up to the observatory, uh, blackening the hillsides and causing between five to $6 million of damage to the observatory's infrastructure. Thankfully, through the heroic efforts of uh, the firefighters from Cal Fire and other allied fire districts, the historic main building and all of the observatory's telescopes and domes were saved. Unfortunately, the historic Barnard House, uh, shown in the lower right corner here, where famous astronomer Barnard lived many years ago, uh, it burned to the ground as did several outbuildings. Um, and while the firefighters were able to save the mountaintop residential housing for observatory staff, some houses had extensive exterior damage and due to the extreme heat of the fire, the windows in all of the houses for the staff on the mountaintop were badly cracked. Uh, over three months after the fire, these windows have still not been replaced. They've now been boarded over to prevent high winds from blowing out the cracked windows and sending broken glass flying. So this is a really, serious health and safety concern for our staff. So as, as I mentioned earlier, um, Fellowship Lick Observatory was founded in 2012. It's a support group that helps to fund various projects to enhance the observatory's educational and public outreach programs, both on and off the mountaintop, as well as to provide seed funding to support the observatory's facilities and its scientific mission. And in normal years, fellow, fellow members would receive a variety of benefits that are tied to the observatory's public events on Mount Hamilton. Unfortunately, as I noted this year, all those events were canceled. And just very quickly in these pictures, the upper left is from uh, every uh, fall, we normally have a event called La Noche de las Estrellas. Uh, Estrellas, my Spanish pronunciation is very bad. Anyway, we bring up um, high school students and their families from uh, Hispanic dominated high schools in East San Jose, Salinas and other uh, parts of the Bay Area for a night of science lectures and ex exhibitions that are conducted in Spanish. Uh, in the lower left, we have uh, our Friends of Lake Observatory booth at a science 
event in San Francisco and our famous Ask an Astronomer booth over here uh, in, with the yellow. We have another event. We had solar telescopes set up on the flight deck of the USS Hornet in uh, Alameda as part of the Splashdown 45 event commemorating the 45th anniversary of the moon landing of which Lick Observatory was a part through the laser uh, lunar ranging experiment. And uh, Follow also spearheaded the development of the Lick Observatory walking tour. And these are a couple of the signs you can find around the mountaintop that give information um, about the particular area that you're looking at. So, um, whoops, we jumped ahead to, there we go. Um, because so much of what we would normally do uh, in a given year has been cut short, you know, shut down by the COVID pandemic, FOLO has shifted its primary focus for 2020 to helping with the observatory's wildfire recovery efforts. And I'm pleased to report that the FOLO Board of Directors has approved an allocation of $75,000, which is the largest single commitment of funds we've ever made. Um, those funds will go to the replacement of the cracked windows. You can see here uh, this sad photo of the cracked windows and the reflection of the burned hillside um, in those windows. Additional funds will be needed to complete this work and much, much more needs to be done, uh, including the need to stabilize the soil on the charred hillsides in advance of the winter rains in order to prevent landslides and mudslides. And there's much work to do in terms of abatement and removal of toxic ash and contaminants to prevent these from uh, getting uh, washed into the ground and contaminating the water table. So more funds are urgently needed to address the extensive wildfire damage. And then unfor unfortunately, the disaster funds from the state and FEMA are already severely stressed due to the massive wildfire damage all across the state and also the very difficult state uh, condition of the state budget. So to encourage donations to the observatory's wildfire relief fund, anyone who donates $50 or more to that fund will receive a one-year complimentary membership to FOLO and any existing FOLO members who donate $50 or more to that fund will see a one-year extension of their current membership. And in addition, for the next two weeks, FOLO members will receive a 20% discount on merchandise purchased from the observatory's online gift shop, which features a variety of observatory and astronomy-related gifts. So if you're thinking of that special holiday gift for a friend or family member, this is a good place to look. Follow members will also receive invitations to a variety of the observatory's online public events uh, and to events like this one. So if you'd like more information on this, send an email to social at uclick.org, put wildfire, Lick Wildfire Relief Fund in the subject line. And I'm also gonna copy this information into the chat window here. And, um, be happy to answer questions about any of that. And thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us and for coming on tonight and um, yeah, in support of helping all the staff and everybody up on, on Mount Hamilton in support of, of Lick. That's really amazing what you all are doing there. So, I guess what sort of people are usually, or who who does uh, Friends of Lick Observatory usually attract? Do you have a lot of, you know, astronomers or usual people that are just sort of appreciative of astronomy and all of that sort of stuff? Who is your membership? Yeah, we we have quite a mix. Um, certainly, a, a number of of. Uh... Uh, astronomers are certainly members, but but a lot of folks are just you know people who are interested in astronomy, people who um, have a fondness for for the observatory, and we also have a very active group of volunteers, um, about seventy volunteers who are the backbone of our summer visitors programs, 
And uh, we, we hold these on, on Friday and Saturday nights uh, throughout the summer normally in their history lectures. There's observing through two of the telescopes, the, the one meter refractor, uh, reflector, I'm sorry, um, and, and the 36 inch refractor, the historic telescope. We also have a number of amateur astronomers who bring their telescopes up and set them up in the parking lot. So they're incredible evenings. These events usually sell out within a matter of hours. They're that popular uh, when, we, when we open them up, uh, typically in, in March or April. And I'm hoping maybe things will be back to normal in time for summer 2021, but yeah. We, we just don't know yet between the pandemic and the fire damage. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay, yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for coming on. And we'll definitely be sure to post that information um, underneath the, the YouTube video in the chat or in the video description so that people can send emails and, and support this uh, relief effort. So thank All right. you, Bob. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you. I'll, I'll, I'll stay on, but I'm going to turn off my camera. OK, <laughs> sounds good. All right, yeah. So definitely send the email, you all. Um, yeah, make a donation. Become a member of Friends of Lick Observatory. Seems like a really great organization that's doing a lot of really wonderful stuff. Okay, so let's get to the black holes, shall we? So first up, we have Brenna Mockler, um, again from UCSC, joining us here tonight to talk. So Brenna, come on there. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Glad to be there. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So what will you be talking um, about tonight? So I'm gonna be talking about how we can learn about how we can find black holes and how we can learn about them and specifically about a special type of um, explosion sort of situation that happens near a black hole called a tidal disruption event. Wow, an explosion, yes. Okay, well, I'm excited. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen and I'll let you have the floor. Thank you. I will share my screen in a moment. Okay. Uh, great, do you see it here? Yep. Awesome. Okay, hi, I'm Brenna, and along with my colleague Sierra, I'm gonna tell you guys about supermassive black holes, um, how we can find them, what we can learn from them. And whenever I talk about my research, I like to start by saying that black holes are actually really simple. And this kind of surprises people because they think of black holes as these like crazy intense objects. Um, and they are really crazy and extreme, but they're also pretty easy to describe with math. So we all we have to know about black holes is their mass, so how much they weigh, uh, to be able to describe them really well. There's a few other parameters that help, but just with their mass alone, we can learn a lot about them. And so this quote, black holes are simpler than forests, I think is really good at describing that because there's forests, if someone, if you visit a forest and you're trying to um, learn about it and someone just tells you how much mass all of the trees weigh, that's not gonna be very helpful. You're gonna need to know a lot more details. Um, and that's true for a lot of things on earth. Black holes are simpler than most things on earth. Um, but despite this, um, they influence a lot of things in the universe. So they influence galaxy evolution, they provide really extreme examples of general relativity. And so by studying them, we can learn more about the universe. And so I'm going to give some background on black holes and then zoom in on my more particular research. So this is, a, this is gonna be a video of the, our galaxy, of zooming in in our galaxy. This is the disk. And then here we're zooming in from the outskirts towards the center. And I'm just gonna pause right here. So, oh, I forgot, I forgot to mention, we're zooming in towards the center where there's a supermassive black hole. It's the, the fun surprise. So um, what we see here are many, many stars. And it turns out 
that the stellar neighborhood close to the center of the galaxy is much denser and has many more stars than the neighborhood around our own sun. And so if we were to say move our earth from where, where it currently is in the outskirts of the galaxy towards the middle of the galaxy, we would see a very different sky. We'd see many suns in the sky. And um, this is just because instead of the stars being like little pinpricks in the distance, they would actually be closer to the size of our sun because they'd be really nearby. So that would look really cool. It would be very bad for humans and life. So we're glad that we live where we do, but it's a fun thought experiment. So if we zoom in further, we're going through billions of stars and we're going to eventually get close to the actual black hole in the middle. And I'll pause it again when we're close. Okay. So here are just a few dozen stars that are really close to the central black hole. And once I press play again, we'll see that these stars are actually moving almost entirely under the influence of that big black hole. So we can't see the black hole because it's a black hole, but we can see how the orbits of the stars are affected by the black hole. Okay, so here they are moving around. Sorry about the flash, it's just um, how the, from, from the actual photos that were taken. So I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but these are real images. So this is actually pictures of stars right next to the black hole that were taken by telescopes. Um, and this is really amazing to me because as we went through that movie, as we moved in on the central black hole, you guys could probably see that we were passing through many stars, with billions of stars. And so we are able on Earth to look through all of those stars and find and pick out the stars that are really close to the central black hole. I kind of think about this like light pollution, like if you're trying to look at the night sky and you're standing under a street lamp, it's going to be really hard to see the stars because of the light of the street lamp. Similarly, if we're trying to look at the stars in the center of the galaxy, there's the light pollution of all of the stars in between us and those stars at the center. So it's really impressive that astronomers have gotten good enough, not, not me, but have gotten really good at extracting the light from all of those intermediate stars and in focusing on the ones near the black hole. And so this star in particular, you can see my cursor is moving. Okay, it just ended. I'll play that bit again. Is moving around in an ellipse, elliptical orbit around the central black hole. And so by studying this, we can actually measure the mass of the black hole because we can look at all of the orbits of these stars that are really close and we can um, estimate how much, how big that black hole has to be, which is really cool because we can't see it. It's clear, it's, it's right in here somewhere, but we can't actually see the black hole. Well, we can measure it by looking at how it affects the stars nearby. Um, unfortunately, most galaxies are further away. And so we can't just, we can't zoom in as easily in the center of the galaxy. And we have to find other methods of both finding this, the black hole um, or multiple black holes and also uh, measuring their masses and other properties. And so I have a couple guiding questions for this, for these series of talks that Sierra and I came up with. And one is how do black holes at the centers of galaxies get to be so big? And also how can we find more black holes? And so I mentioned that we're specifically talking about supermassive black holes. Um, what does that mean? Well, when stars actually, or when black holes actually form, they are the mass of the stars that they form from. So black holes form when a really big star collapses and dies and um, becomes very, very dense to the point that the gravity is so strong that even light can't escape it. And then that defines the black hole. So at birth, the black hole is about the same mass as the stars they're made from. And the biggest stars in our universe are gonna be hundreds of times the mass of our sun. But the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies are millions to billions of times the mass of our sun. So really we're just saying supermassive to mean extra big because the first black hole, when black holes first form, they're gonna be closer to the mass of, of stars, but these ones at the center of galaxies are millions to billions of the times the mass of our sun. So how did they get so big? And just to put that, those numbers in perspective, if these massive stars that will form uh, black holes were about the size of this adorable flying squirrel, then the supermassive black holes that we see in the centers of galaxies today would be about the size of blue whales or bigger. And so we have to find a way to get this tiny flying squirrel to grow to the size of a giant blue whale. And it is not very easy to do. 
Um, so how do black holes grow? Well, one thing they can do is collide and merge with other black holes to become one larger black hole. Um, but this is kind of just random chance whether they get close enough to another black hole to do this. Uh, they can also pull in additional surrounding mass through mass accretion. And so the words mass accretion just means the act of pulling in mass. And I think many of you might have already seen this image from the Event Horizon Telescope on the right here. That's of the black, the accretion disk in the M87 galaxy. And so this accretion disk is formed through mass accretion. It's formed as the black hole pulls in mass and it forms it into a disk. Um, that's what we mean by mass accretion. Um, and then through the accretion process, it can actually pull the mass from the disk into, into the black hole. So I'm gonna try to describe accretion using an analogy. One I really like is using a coin wishing well. So if you put a coin in a wishing well, it'll go around and around and it'll eventually fall into the center. You can think of this as gas orbiting around and around and eventually falling into the black hole. Why does it actually fall in? It falls because there's friction between the coin and the wishing well. And so it dissipates energy. And by, by dissipating energy, by losing energy, it's able to fall into the, to the wishing well. And similarly, when gas is accreting, it will be orbiting around the black hole, but to actually fall into the black hole, it needs to lose energy. If it didn't, then we, the, anything orbiting could just randomly fall in, which would not be good on Earth because then satellites could fall in, et cetera. But no, they need, they need to lose energy first. And so I found an even better analogy, I think, while searching for videos of this on YouTube. And it's very similar. It's marbles in a wishing well. So now, if you can imagine that the black hole is at the center and all of these, these marbles are pieces of gas, then as they go around, roll around, they're orbiting the center, but they're hitting each other and they're losing energy. And as they lose energy, they move inwards and eventually fall in. And I think um, something that shows how good of an analogy this is, is uh, the same people who made the last one, they actually make the like fun Marvel videos, um, did the same video, but with glow in the dark marbles. And it looks a lot like an accretion disc forming. So these are actually marbles. This isn't a simulation or anything. It's just glow in the dark marbles. And I think it looks a lot like the formation of an accretion disc and then the accretion of mass through that disc into the black hole, which is pretty cool. I'll actually show next. This is a simulation. This is an actual simulation of a black hole accreting mass. It's not a not real data, but it's, it's a physically accurate simulation or fairly physically accurate simulation. The black hole's in the middle. And I think it looks a lot like those marbles. And so what's happening is the gas is um, hitting itself. Um, it's losing energy and it's falling into the black hole, kind of like the marbles. And so one type of accretion event that I'm very excited about, and which I think is particularly cool, are tidal disruption events. And so this is when it's not, not just like random bits of gas that are pulling into the black hole, but an entire star is pulled in, ripped apart by the black hole and eaten. And so here's a simulation. There's a star and a black hole here. So the star is orbiting the black hole initially, but then it is ripped apart. And then the gas comes back, it forms an accretion disk, and then through friction processes, it falls into the black hole in the same way that the friction processes on the marbles cause them to fall into the wishing well. And I'll show that one more time, but this is with like the initial, this is with the initial stellar orbit. So the star is on a very elliptical orbit. Uh, it's on top of the star here, so you can't quite see it, but the star is this point, the black hole has been marked in blue. And so you see that the star was just orbiting the black hole, but on this last orbit, it got too close. It got ripped apart. And then the black hole is going to feast on the gas from the star. And that's what we call a tidal destruction event. But how does it actually happen? How is the star ripped apart? Turns out it's ripped apart by very strong tides. So tides on Earth um, are when the moon pulls on the Earth. And so the ocean, um, or more specifically, the ocean is pulled by the moon. And so the, the height of the ocean changes. So we have a stronger pull on the side of the Earth with, and the ocean that's closest to the moon, a weaker pole furthest away from that. 
And that's just because gravity is stronger as you move closer to the object pulling on you. So the side of the earth, the side of the oceans that are closest to the moon are gonna be pulled stronger. As I didn't really say, these, this little um, schematic is supposed to be the tides. It's, uh, it's obviously um, not to scale here. Um, so this side is gonna be pulled stronger. This side will be pulled weaker. Um, the actual center of mass of the earth will be pulled somewhere in between. And what ends up happening is one side of the ocean is getting pulled ahead of the earth and the other side of the ocean is getting left behind. And so what we actually see is a kind of elongating from this, this differential pulling from the moon. And so the, the ocean is elongated on either side and that makes tides. But as I said, this isn't to scale. The change in height of the ocean from tides is really just one millionth the side of the earth, the size of the earth. So if we made it to scale, you wouldn't really be able to see anything on this diagram. However, if we replace the moon with a black hole, the gravitational force is much larger. And so tides, the, the tidal gravity from a black hole might make the Earth more, look more like this. In fact, the Earth would stretch out and eventually it would rip apart. This is not a simulation. This is just me playing around in Kino. But we would get the tidal disruption of the Earth if we had a black hole too close by. So similarly, um, if the tides around stars close to black holes get too strong, they can get pulled apart. And here's a simulation of that happening. So this is a star under the gravity of a nearby black hole. And eventually it's just ripped apart. Gas goes everywhere. That's running again. Um, gas goes anywhere, everywhere and the star is destroyed. Let's show one more schematic to kind of help people picture what's happening. Here we have a black hole in gray. The star is coming in on this very, this, this orbit that's very elliptical. So it gets really close to the black hole on one side and it's very far on the other side of the orbit. And when it's near the black hole, it gets ripped apart. And then some of the, the gas will remain in orbit around the black hole. That's what creates this accretion disk. Some of it will head off into space. So one more time with this simulation, star comes in, it's ripped apart, it forms an accretion disk, and some of it will, will feed the black hole while some of it is lost to space. So what do we actually see from telescopes? At this point, all I've shown you are simulations on computers, which are very pretty, but aren't real data. Um, so this is, that's the name of the person who took the photo, not the, this is the Swope Telescope in Chile. And this is a sample light curve. And so what we see when these flare, when these tidal disruption events happen, when these accretion disks are accreting mass, we see a flare of light. So as the mass loses energy at, from friction in the accretion disk, as the gas is hitting itself, it's producing shocks, um, the friction is heating it up and it's releasing a lot of light. And so we see this flare of light. It turns out for tidal disruption events, the time scale is days to months, we, but, but what we see is that um, as there's more and more mass that's falling into the black hole and hitting, um, hitting itself, the, the light increases and at late times it decreases. And we call this a light curve, pretty simple. Um, so if I say light curve, this is what I mean. It turns out that for tidal disruption events and for most mass flows, the brightness traces the mass flow to the black hole. And I kind of explained this already, um, but I'll kind of try to explain it better now. It's just that the, the light is coming from the process of accretion. It, just like those marbles were losing energy before they fell in to the wishing well, the gas is losing energy as it falls into the black hole and that energy has to go somewhere. It's radiated as light and we observe it with our telescope. Um, it turns out that for TDEs, the light curve is very dependent on the mass of the black hole. And so this is really exciting because it means that not only do tidal disruption events give us an opportunity to find black holes, they light up black holes that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Um, they also tell us about the black hole. They uh, can tell us more things, but, but they're best at telling us about the mass of the black hole. So if we look at this light curve again, it's, um, again, just the brightness versus the time. So it flares up and then it decreases at later times. Um, if we increase the mass of the black hole that's creating this light curve, 
it starts to change like this. It, it um, basically lengthens out in time. So the flare um, takes a lot longer to, to fade away. And it turns out that smaller black holes cause quicker flares and bigger black holes cause longer flares. And so by looking at the length of the flare from the telescope, we can learn about the mass of the black hole. We have a quick explanation of why this is. Um, so if you have a smaller black hole, then the orbit of the star, um, the star is torn apart closer to the black hole. But if you have a bigger black hole, the star is torn apart further from the black hole just because the black hole's gravity is stronger. But if it's turn, torn apart for, further away from the black hole, then its orbit will be longer. And if its orbit is longer or larger, then the time for the mass, for the gas from the star to, to actually accrete onto the black hole takes longer. It has to go on this longer orbit before it can come back and form the secretion disk. And just because of that, the flare around the bigger black hole is gonna be longer. So here's real data from two tidal disruption events that, that show this, um, where I have a brightness again on the y-axis and time in days, the same time scale for both plots in, on the x-axis. And we can see that the flare on the left is a lot shorter than the flare on the right. And this is because the flare on the left comes from a smaller black hole than a fl the flare on the right. So they're both digesting stars. They both rip stars apart and are eating them, but one of the black holes is a lot smaller than the other one. It's actually 10 times smaller. But I think it's really cool that even by eye, you could guess that the flare on the right came from a larger black hole. Um, and then one of the things I do in my research is use much more complicated models to fit uh, these light curves and estimate the actual size of the black hole. Um, so these, these black points, I didn't mention this earlier, these black points are approximately where the data is, um, and then the, the colored curves are appro my, my approximate fits to them. Okay, so I'm, um, that's all I have for you guys. I have a bit of a recap, but I think I'm over time, so I'm just going to end here. Um, and thank you so much. Wow, really nice. Thank you, Brenna. I really liked uh, some of your um, simulations and those images at the end looked really cool. I really liked that marble analogy. Uh, I had never seen that before and I'd seen the, the singular coin, but it was really nice seeing like all the marbles together and then like colliding and all of that stuff. That was really cool. Yeah, I hadn't seen that. I was actually just Googling YouTube videos for this presentation. It's like, oh wow, this is great. <laughs> wow. Oh, and also your your earth getting ripped apart. Are you sure that that's not physical? That wasn't a real that wasn't a real model. Um, yeah, no, that was I, I learned that you can mask images in Kino and then I played around with it is what happened there. That was so funny. It looked like a, a broken egg or something like this. Wow. Wow, so also very cool that you can get the mass of the black hole from the, the shape of the, the light curve from the TDE. Yeah, yeah, that's really exciting to us as astronomers because as I was saying, for galaxies outside our own galaxy, it's really hard to measure the masses of black holes. So we kind of have to get lucky and see layers of light from them and then try to make out what's happening and tidal disruption events happen to be a really easy way to do this. So, um, or when they happen, it's, it's fairly straightforward to find the mass of the black hole, which is really cool. What sort of distances are these black holes at that you're studying? Uh, it depends, but um, oh, I'm not sure what, I'm trying to think of what the closest one would be and I should know this, but I don't. But they're, so they're gonna be in far away galaxies for the most part, um, could be kiloparsecs away. But um, yeah, there, there's, there's occasionally some that happen closer by, luckily not too close, um, but I don't know the closest one off the top of my head. Wow. Yeah, so like for, you know, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, you can tell because, I mean, very amazingly, they can observe like singular stars and things like that and see how fast they're moving. but but we can't get that sort of imaging and resolution for, for any other black hole. So this is a very cool way to, to solve that problem.
So we've got some questions for you um, from YouTube. The first is, what are you most excited about for the future of TDE research? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so one thing that I didn't mention in this talk um, is that we actually own, TDE research is fairly new. So we knew this would happen for a while. We knew that if a star got too close, it would be ripped apart, but we hadn't seen them until the last decade. Um, really, we'd seen some maybe in the 2000s, but we, we got our first really good one in 2010. So it's a pretty new field. We're still getting a lot more data and it's really exciting to just be at the point where we have like more than 10 really well-measured events. Um, and so I'm really excited, like many other people who study transients like supernova or TDEs, just for some of the really big telescopes that are coming out soon that'll be surveying the entire sky um, very over fairly short time periods, because as, as I was showing, these events are kind of taking place over weeks, months, time scales. So we need fairly good follow up in time. Um, and so with some of the, like the large synoptic survey telescope, for example, is just gonna give us like way more TDEs than we've ever seen before, like hundreds and hundreds. And we're probably gonna find all sorts of weird stuff, um, like weird older stars and um, maybe even double black holes, like lots of cool systems that you don't necessarily expect to find um, with just a handful of mm -hmm. samples. Wow, that sounds awesome. All right, one more or many more actually there. <laughs> They're pouring in. Is it hard to get actual data where you observe these TDEs? Yes. So I luckily don't have to get the data myself. <laughs> I'm on the theory side of things. So I make up models and try to explain the data. Um, it is hard. So the ones that we see tend to be similarly bright to supernova, so to exploding stars. Um, but it is they are fairly rare events. So I kind of alluded to this when I said we hadn't seen that many yet. Um, even though we think of a black hole as very large compared to the like size of the galaxy, I guess we think of it as it's very massive, but it's not very extended. It's radius isn't that big. So it's physical size. If it was like a sphere that you could see is not that big compared to its mass and certainly not compared to the galaxy. So it's actually really hard to kind of throw a star onto an orbit that will actually get close enough to the black hole to be ripped apart. I heard this analogy that it was like, um, it's similar probability to, or similar likelihood to throwing a grain of salt through a sewing needle from like a mile or two away or something like that. <laughs> and it's just that, that, that sewing needle being the, the radius of the black hole and the grain of salt being the star. It's, it's really hard to actually get it through there or get it close enough to be disrupted. Um, wow, I just forgot the, the <laughs> question that I was answering. Got excited about my analogy. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you sort of answered the question talking about the difficulty of, of getting data on TDEs. Right, right. So it's hard to find them, but then once we do see them, it's pretty easy to observe them. Okay. Because they're fairly bright. Nice. And how many observations do we have currently? How many observations of TDE? Mm -hmm. So this is a little up for debate because sometimes we can't be positive if it's a TDE or if it's a supernova that happens really close to the center of the galaxy. Um, but we can confidently say that we're more than 20 now. I would say that we're getting close to like, it also depends whether we count really well measured ones or ones that we just, as I said, we just think probably are. But um, I expect in the next few years we'll have like hundreds. And right now we're probably under a hundred. Wow. 20 to 100. <laughs> the reasonable range for an astronomer, I should say, I think. Yeah, no big data for this one quite yet. Well, the, that's the thing. We, we do think there will be big, there will be with LSST and some of these telescopes, they'll be getting like thousands. So. Okay, nice. Um, all right. And why does the gas that doesn't fall into the black hole after a tidal disruption event not follow the original orbit? It looked like it was Ooh. getting like that's a great question. That is a really good question. Okay, so it turns out that um, when the star is on its initial orbit, uh, all of the gas is kind of following the orbit of the center of mass of the star. So even though some of the gas is on one side of the star and some of the gas is on the other side of the star, it's all following the orbit of the, 
the center of mass of the star. When the star is disrupted, however, the mass that's least bound to the black hole on the far side of the star can become unbound. And this, the mass that's closest to the star is gonna be even more bound. Um, I guess, I don't know if I should use, use the word bound, but is going to feel an even stronger pull of gravity where the stuff, the mass on the far side will be feel less strong pull of gravity. And so the mass that's closest to the black hole is gonna be in a tighter orbit. And the mass that's furthest from the black hole, it might just be in a really weak orbit, but it can actually become unbound from the black hole and just fly off into space. Wow, <laughs> very cool. Very, very cool. Okay, next question. How much brighter are the events compared to the, the initial star? Um, oh, wow. Many, many times brighter. Um, I need an observer to give me, let's see, <laughs> the, the luminosity of the sun is about 10 to the 33. These events are about 10 to the 10 times brighter, I would say, or so. Oh, wow. Yeah, a lot brighter. Or to the power of 10, is that? Yeah, it, it's more than more than a billion times brighter. <laughs> we'll put it that okay. way. <laughs> okay. And then two more questions for you. Could you clarify how you know the mass of a star before a tidal event occurs? Do you tend to know in advance that these events are about to occur? We don't. So because the last the last question kind of led into this, which is really nice. So so the brightness of the star is way it's it's much dimmer than the actual flare that we get from the disruption or from the accretion of the gas. Um, Sierra will talk more about how accreting gas is just like the brightest thing in the universe. Um, so because it's so much brighter, we can see it out to much further than we could the actual star. So we're seeing these events at distances where we might not be able to discern the actual star. Sometimes we can, but um, we couldn't pick it out easily. Whereas the, the flare that we see, we can pick out really easily. It shows up on, on most telescopes that, that we use for science. So it makes it a lot, um, yeah. So, so, we, so I guess the, the answer is that we don't know ahead of time. We don't know that it's gonna happen. Um, we can, guess from the environment around the black hole and Sierra will talk about that too but um but we we can't like track the stars right before it happens for these galaxies if we could then we'd actually be able to kind of show the, that movie like the one I showed early on for our galaxy but for other galaxies but sadly we cannot can the light curve from the TDE also tell you something about the mass of the star or just the mass of the black hole it, it certainly can. Um, so as you might expect, if it's a bigger star, the light curve will probably be brighter. Mm -hmm. um, however, there are other things that affect this. Um, one of them is how good the accretion processes are at releasing energy. Um, sometimes if, um, if you have like, if you have something that kind of just hits itself once and then is able to kind of cancel out its momentum and fall in, that might not be very bright, but if the material is able to get into orbits that are really close to the black hole, then they'll be moving nearly at the speed of light. So okay. then if material that's right by the edge of the black hole hits other material, you're gonna get really, really bright shocks and you're gonna release a lot more energy, which will also make it brighter. So it's hard to tell whether it's details in the accretion process or if it's the mass of a star. And that's actually one of the really big questions in modeling these events right now in the field because we'd really like to do a better job at separating the, the estimates of the mass of the star we get from the estimates of the how efficiency this accretion process is, how efficient this accretion process is. Wow, lots of details. And the final question, I'd like to ask about the correlation between the size of a galaxy's bulge and the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Okay, um, <laughs> this is just asking why the correlation exists. We're not sure is the answer there. So it was discovered, um, and one of the people who's done a lot of work on this is actually um, an astronomer in our department, so Sandy Faber, um, at very well, well now, she's retired now, but she's done a lot of brilliant work, um, and she's done a lot of work on this. But we actually, so astronomers discovered this correlation before 
they actually were able to understand it. And so we still don't know exactly why this is the case. I mean, you could, a really like simple answer could be like, oh, well, if there's like more mass then maybe somehow it's able to feed the black hole and make it bigger. Or maybe if like it was able to create more mass, maybe there was also more mass in the center of the galaxy and so the black hole got bigger, but we actually don't know for sure. But we do know that they seem to grow together, which is cool. Yeah, that is. Wow, lots of really great questions and really awesome answers from you. Thank you so much for a really, really wonderful presentation. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> that was really fun. All right, thank you, Brenna. And yeah, please come back and, and join us <laughs> another time for another talk. Thanks so much for hosting. Good night, see you. Okay, yeah, that was really awesome. And thank you all for some really, really great questions. Um, those were really good. You all are really paying attention. <laughs> all right, so now a little bit of trivia for you all. Of course, it's Astronomy on Tap. We've got to do some themed trivia. Now it's December, so we're going into the holidays. So I'll present this and share my screen with you all. And you should have a link to a Google form online so that you can answer these questions as I go along asking the questions. So I'll share my screen here. Oh, and also before I do so, I just wanna say that I have got um, <laughs> a glass of wine now to sip on. Um, in honor of my mother, who apparently is also drinking a glass of wine and watching along with us tonight. So shout out to Carla. <laughs> All right, let's get into some trivia. All right, so December holiday trivia. Are you all ready? Here we go. So, December 25th, which apple-loving or hating physicist was born on this day in 1642? December 25th, which apple-loving or hating physicist was born on this day in 1642? Interesting. <laughs> I think I know that one. All right, let's go on to number two. December 25th, wow. <laughs> on this day in 1758, the first predicted observation of a comet was recorded. Name the comet. December 25th, on this day in 1758, the first predicted observation of a comet was recorded. Name the comet. I don't know if I know this one. I am not very good at trivia. Are we ready for the next one? I'm imagining you all giving me a thumbs up. Here I go. All right, number three, December 25th. Here's looking at you, kid. Which Hollywood star was born on this day in 1899? A, Henry Fonda. B, Christian Bale, C, Cary Grant, or D, Humphrey Bogart. Here's looking at you, kid. I'm assuming that's a hint to the answer. Um, which Hollywood star was born on this day in 1899? A, Henry Fonda, B, Christian Bale, C, Cary Grant, and D, Humphrey Bogart. Um might be showing showing my age my I'm a youngin so I don't think I know the answer to this one here we go number four star of wonder a uh, star of light star with royal beauty bright the star of Bethlehem may very well be an actual astronomical event in history what could it be a, a gravitational wave, B, a supernova, C, AGN, which is active galactic nuclei, or D, comet. 
again, the question, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright. The star of Bethlehem may very well be an actual astronomical event in history. What could it be? Oh, gravitational wave, supernova, AGN, or a comet. I know that this is an online form, but I'm imagining you all furiously scribbling down your answers on pencil and paper. All right, now to astronomy in the news. Question number five. The fifth moon of which planet was discovered by Lick Observatory? A, Earth, B, Mars, C, Jupiter, or D, Saturn? Again, the fifth moon of which planet was discovered by Lick Observatory? A, Earth, B, Mars, C, Jupiter, or D, Saturn? I'm sure Bob knows the answer to this one. All right, now to question number six. Which radio telescope catastrophically collapsed on Tuesday? Oh, this was sad. A, FAST, B, ALMA, C, Arecibo Telescope, or D, Green Bank Telescope? Which radio telescope catastrophically collapsed on Tuesday? Was it FAST, ALMA, Arecibo, or Green Bank Telescope? Seven, this message was written by Carl Sagan to tell aliens about who we are encoded in binary and sent by the telescope in the previous question. Where was it sent? This message was written by Carl Sagan to tell aliens about who we are encoded in binary and sent by the telescope in the previous question. Where was it sent? Was it A, the outer solar system, B, a nearby star, C, a nearby star cluster, or D, a nearby galaxy. Yeah, and this is sort of a hint for the last one, if you have ever seen contact. Maybe I'm giving it away. I should stop. <laughs> Okay, and now some trivia on black holes. Hopefully you learned enough in the past 30 minutes to get these right. How can black holes grow? A, by absorbing gravitational waves. B, by merging with other black holes. C, by drinking protein shakes. Or D, by accreting surrounding mass. And this question does have multiple correct answers. So if you get them all, you get extra credit. So again, how can black holes grow? A, by absorbing gravitational waves. B, by merging with other black holes. C, by drinking protein shakes. Or D, by accreting surrounding mass. Or, oh, I guess uh, the astronaut is surrounding mass, so. They're feeding the black hole. What a way to go. All right, question number nine. What does TDE stand for in astronomy? A, Top Dog Entertainment. B, Tidal Decay of Entropy. C, Tidal Disruption Explosion. Or D, Tidal Disruption Event. Oh my God. <laughs> My money is on A, gotta be A, definitely gotta be A. What does TDE stand for in astronomy? A, Top Dog Entertainment, B, Tidal Decay of Entropy, C, Tidal Disruption Explosion, or D, Tidal Disruption Event? Got your answers locked in.
And true or false, a smaller black hole produces a longer light flare during a tidal disruption event than a larger black hole. True or false, a smaller black hole produces a longer light flare during a tidal disruption event than a larger black hole. I'm thinking to the figure in Brenna's talk that talked exactly about this. Wow, this is like pop quiz, like you're in class or something. All right, question 11. What's the primary process that allows for mass orbiting a black hole in an accretion disk to fall into the black hole? Is it A, loss of energy through friction, B, gamma ray radiation from the gas, C, fusion explosions in the disk, or D, emission of gravitational waves? Again, what's the primary process that allows for mass orbiting a black hole in an accretion disk to fall into the black hole? Is it A, a loss of energy through friction, B, gamma ray radiation from the gas, or C, fusion explosions in the disk, or D, emission of gravitational waves? I mean, you all are going to have physics PhDs by the end of this quiz. Come on. Oh, okay. And those are the answers. Okay. So we'll go over the answers at the end of the talk. And let me see. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we're going to see if there are any requests to give any of the questions again, which it doesn't look like there are. And in that case, we will keep going to our next speaker. Okay. <laughs> so I guess also before I give the answers, then again, you know, over the course of the next however, you know, 20 minutes or so, if you want to hear a question again or something like that, let us know. Otherwise, lock those answers in, submit your form, and uh, hopefully you get a wonderful prize, which is my um, celebration and, and adoration and, and all of that sort of stuff, which hopefully is good enough. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to our second speaker. We've got Sierra Dodd coming up. So come on down. <laughs> Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? How is your wine? Oh, it's uh, not that great. It was a $4 bottle and not the, you know, good kind of $4 bottle, but it's, it's doing well. Yeah. Did you uh, do well on the quiz, you think, on the trivia? Well, Brent and I helped write the black hole question, so oh. <laughs> yes, I did very well on okay. those. <laughs> I would hope so. That's good to hear. <laughs> Okay, so give us a little preview about what you're going to be talking about tonight. So I'm going to be talking about quasars, which I'll explain in a little bit, and in particular, a very weird type of quasar known as changing look quasars. Wow. Okay, I'm excited to hear about this. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen, and then I'll leave it to you. Okay. All right, so let me play. Okay, so yeah, Brenna talks about um, tidal disruption events, which I'm showing here. Um, and she did a great job hinting at some of the things I was gonna talk about too. But stepping back a little bit, so from, from a black hole's perspective, a tidal disruption event is a feast, but it happens very rarely. Cause she mentioned that that analogy of what was it, throwing a grain of salt through a needle. So not, not extremely frequent. Um, so you can think of supermassive black holes that have TDEs as fasting most of the time. 
But I'm going to talk about a different way to light up black holes, and that involves a different type of supermassive black hole that is actually continuously feasting all of the time. So that sounds a little more um, up my alley, and those are known as quasars. So what I'm showing you here is an artist's rendition of a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. So again, these are tens of billions of times the mass of our sun, which is just a lot to a lot to try to process. And like Brenna showed us with the marbles analogy and with the really cool simulations, this is an accretion disk. So the gas is slowly funneling in and as it does, it has to lose a lot of energy in order for it to um, radiate and eventually fall into the central black hole. So these objects, like she mentioned, are actually the brightest objects in the universe, which I think is very cool. Um, people think of black holes as being dark and spooky, and they are a little bit, but they're also the brightest objects in the universe. So that's exciting. Um, they're also very messy eaters, which is how we see them. So this in particular is a jet. And we think those are caused by really strong magnetic fields around the black hole that as everything's orbiting around, things get kicked up. And these are basically like particle accelerators. So those are cool. But you might be wondering, where does it get this like continuous supply of gas? The answer is a little creepy. They get it from the galaxies that they live in. So this is a picture from Hubble of a young star forming galaxy. So the blue areas are where there's a lot of new young stars. And what happens is just over time, the same cold gas that those stars are born from, it eventually can funnel in towards the central supermassive black hole. So it's a little bit cannibalistic, but that's nature. A little bit of history. So I mentioned that these things are the brightest things in the universe, but they're all quite far away which is good for us, we don't get like irradiated by them, but they're so distant that even the closest one, which I've shown here, 3C273, astronomers are very good at naming things, we know that, um, it looks a little bit underwhelming if you don't have a good telescope. So this is with a small telescope. You can't see them like just looking out at the sky, but if you have, I think, a 15 inch telescope, you can see quasars at night. So when astronomers first saw these objects, Unsurprisingly, they were like, I don't know, it looks like a star. I don't blame them. I would have been like, yeah, small, small star perhaps. But there were some weird signals about it. Um, so they named them quasi-stellar radio source. And somehow that got shortened to quasar. It's a little, little fuzzy how that acronym formed, but ended up calling them quasars. And the name has stuck, even though we now know that they are not stars. So the way that people determined that they weren't stars is they decided to take the light coming from one of these quasars and split it with something like a prism. So the same way a prism can take white light and make a rainbow, which I've kind of shown you here, you can do that outside of the visible light spectrum. So what this plot is showing, we've got brightness of light on the Y axis here. And then on the X axis, we just have wavelength. So longer wavelengths out here, might be like radio or something like that. And then our rainbow is the visible spectrum. And then purple is UV. So what you'll notice is that this curve of what a normal star is, it typically peaks or is at its highest brightness in the visible light ranges. Um, and when they looked at quasars though, they immediately noticed that they were doing something very different. So they do, they do emit invisible, we see that but they emit really, really brightly at higher energies. So lower wavelengths, higher energies. Um, so into the UV and into the X-ray. And this immediately clued people in, this can't be a star because stars are powered by fusion and we know how much energy that should produce. And so people were able to deduce that these must be fueled by supermassive black holes with accretion disks. So this is a really cool video of um, an artist rendition of what an accretion disk might look like. So something that is cool to think about is that the size of this accretion disk, it varies from each black hole, but for these quasars, it can be the size of our entire solar system. So that just kind of blows you away a little bit. 
And they have these really bright beacons that we can see from so far away. And typically quasars, I mentioned that they're continuous eaters, they could feast for about 10 million years. That's sort of the average, average meal time. It's, it's normal. Um, before they kind of like drain the galaxy of all its cold gas. A little bit like a vampire, but a good one. Um, so these are really bright, but they're really far away. And even though the accretion disk is the size of our solar system, the closest quasar's accretion disk would only take up one one hundred thousandth of a single pixel on Hubble Space Telescope. So what this means is it's very hard for us to study these closely. So instead, what people do is they come up with really cool computer simulations. So this is from a team of people at UC Santa Cruz. I, I didn't help with this one, but I think it's so cool. Um, so the orangish brown is the accretion disk and the blue is outflows of like gas and winds. So I'll play that. It's pretty exciting. I think, I don't know if this team in particular, but different teams are working on viewing these through like VR, which that would be neat. So this is state of the art, top notch simulation took, I don't know how many hours, but many, many hours on a supercomputer to run and to visualize in 3D. And we have the scientific information about it. So there's so much we can do with it. And already so many problems have been simplified and even solved with these but they aren't perfect and there's still a lot left to learn. So for example, these accretion disks, I mentioned the size of our solar system. Some of the different variability we see in them starts out at a scale of like one foot. And so your simulation has to simultaneously be able to re resolve to look at one foot to capture these initial perturbations, but then also be the whole size of the solar system. So we haven't figured it out perfectly, but people have really clever ways of trying to mitigate those problems. Um, so one of the many mysteries left unsolved though, is this unique type of quasar called a changing look quasar. So these are found by different types of telescopes that are on sort of survey mode. So their job is to look out at the night sky and they slowly make their way through whatever hemisphere they're in. And then once they're done, they just start over again. And the first pass, as one of these observatories looked at a galaxy, it might see something like this. Beautiful, um, relatively calm, not much going on. But when they look later, they might see something wild. So this is an artist's rendition, a little carried away in my opinion, but it's nice, it's nice. It makes, it makes a good point. Um, so when they look at it later, it's basically just exploded and it's ignited this crazy energetic quasar, brightest things in our universe, and what's surprising about this is that the best calculations we have to date say that it should take somewhere around 10,000 years for something to go from absolutely quiet to full-blown accreting at maximum, you know, really pumping it out, 10,000 years. But we found these in years and even months. So as it stands, they've kind of broken our models that explain quasars, we just don't know. And accretion, how can, how can matter come from so far in to the black hole so quickly when it wasn't there a couple months ago? So astronomers are very confused and that excites us. A lot of, a lot of mystery there. Um, and what, just to reiterate, what makes them different from regular quasars is that regular quasars, they're known to vary in brightness, but for the most part, they're happy just eating for their you know 10 million years steady supply. But these ones are just doing absolutely wild things and we're confused. So I mentioned before the fact that the accretion disk where a lot of this activity is happening and where the black hole is, is feeding, we can't resolve it with our telescopes yet. It's just too far away. So what I did for my first year project was to look at something we can see, which is the galaxies where these bl weird black holes live. So I compared a sample of 15 changing look quasars to half a million galaxies. And the goal was just to see, is there anything that we can observe that might tell us why these, why these are behaving so strangely? And one of our findings was that galaxies with changing look quasars, excuse me, are more centrally concentrated than some comparable galaxy. 
So on the left hand side here, I'm showing you real data from one of our changing look quasars. And I think after seeing so many simulations, it can be <laughs> a little underwhelming, but we can get a lot of good information from this data. And you'll notice maybe it's a little bit faint, but that the central region here where my cursor is, is pretty dense and pretty bright. Whereas if you look at a, a similar galaxy, as I call it, it's quite a bit more diffuse and spread out as a whole. And so we did some stuff to make sure that we could compare these galaxies and that they were similar in a lot of other factors. So what it tells us is that maybe just by having more gas and more stars in the central region where the supermassive black hole is, maybe you could get something like a star going through that accretion disk I showed. Maybe it's puncturing the accretion disk and making like spiral waves. We don't know for sure, but we know that there's a for sure a correlation with more centrally concentrated galaxies being where quas changing look quasars like to live. So that's interesting. And then our second finding was that changing look quasars are likely not caused by recent galaxy mergers. And let me back up a little bit to say why, why we thought to compare this. So early on, and similar to what Brenna was saying, where TDEs are pretty new, changing look quasars are also pretty new. We've only I think the first recent paper was like 2015. And now we have about like 80 or so um, that have been discovered. And so people are speculating what, you know, what could cause this. And one of the ideas was, okay, if we need to take a galaxy that was quiet and then all of a sudden just flood it with material so fast, what if that was caused by two galaxies that merge? So that seems sort of plausible. And we decided to test that by seeing how symmetric our changing look quasars were compared to a sample of galaxies that we knew had recently undergone a merger. So you'll see that these ones that have undergone a merger have like extra appendages and very distorted. It's a chaotic time when you go through a merger and our changing look quasars were all really symmetric. So that kind of told us that if anything, changing look quasars we found were more symmetric than an average galaxy. So we can't rule out that there was ever a merger like in the way distant past, but they're at least not in the middle of one very recently. It hasn't been in their like recent history. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but where does that leave us? Well, we still don't know what causes changing what quasars. So we were able to rule, rule a little bit out um, and maybe identify habitats where they like to live which can help us find more. But in the future, we're really excited because people will continue discovering more of them so we can, we can compare more. And then hopefully computer simulations will be able to model some of these accretion disks and maybe do something like a star coming through, something that could help get the matter in faster. So, so yeah, a lot left to be discovered, but we definitely made some progress. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. I had never uh, really heard about changing look quasars before. Yeah. So it really does mean their variability is on like shorter time scales or something like this. Yeah. And I think part of why they're, they're not quite talked about as much is that some of the discoveries it was sort of like Brandon was mentioning with TDEs. Sometimes they're disputed. There's mm -hmm. not, they're hard to tell exactly what's going on, but there are definitely a good sample of ones that are just making no sense to us. We even found one, well, we, not me, I didn't do it, but somebody <laughs> found one where it turned off. They, it went from being this super bright quasar and then just like disappeared. Mm -hmm. And then maybe like six months later, it turned back on again. So Six they're just messing with us. They, <laughs> they're doing it on purpose. They know we're looking. <laughs> in our faces. It's wow. <laughs> okay, you've got some questions coming in from the chat. The first is, when you say we can't rule out they weren't recent mergers, what time frame is that? <laughs> That's a really good question. <laughs> I, I would have to double check for like specifics. So another factor, a little bit deeper info is that the data we use, the pictures I showed you are from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is great, but it also doesn't go quite as deep as some other telescopes. So one way that we could constrain and give you a number of like, you know, nothing more than like a hundred million years ago 
would be if we got telescope time with a more powerful telescope, because that would allow us to detect any faint appendages around the galaxy. Because right now we can just be like, well, there aren't any bright ones, which buys us a lot of time. But if we wanted to be more specific, we would need better data. Okay. So I don't, I don't have a number, but <laughs> <it's a while. laughs> yeah, I guess on the on the the grand scheme of the age of the universe, recent can mean a lot of things and, and a pretty big number yeah yeah okay next question a philosophical question hmm uh oh turn your brain on ma'am <laughs> are, are black holes <laughs> no. I don't need it <laughs> are black holes simpler than forests or do we just not know enough to ask the more complex questions the more we know, will the complexity become greater? Well, that's not fair because Brenna had that quote, not me. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But I just saw it today. So um, I think it's probably that we just don't know because there's still, it really, the whole concept of a singularity, which honestly that like uh, the coin rolling thing was kind of a good analogy because it has that, it just drops off. Mm. But the way with physics, we're supposed to understand a singularity is that it, extends infinitely which it breaks my mind so I think there's plenty we don't know and maybe there's some delightful model some new theory that will like make black holes be simple but I think with what we have I find them confusing <laughs> I don't know wow and I'm sure the answer to the second question is yes the more we know it will definitely be <laughs> more complex because that seems to be the trajectory of, of most things in like physics and astronomy the more you know the more confused you get <laughs> oh, I have a perfect explanation and then you get data and you're like oh terribly wrong <laughs> okay another question for you are there telescopes coming online that you are excited about um, for changing the quasars yeah I think a little bit of a similar answer to Brenna but um the Vera Rubin Observatory or LSST as it used to be known is gonna, I forget the cadence of the observations, but it's something like it's gonna look at the whole sky once a night or something absurd wow. like that. I like, could be wrong, but something like that. Um, Brenna just said, yes, okay, good. Um, <laughs> so the fact that similar to TDEs, they can happen fast if we have more frequent observations, I think we'll find so many more. So something like LSST, I think, or Vera Rubin Observatory will be really, really useful. And there's also another one called the Young Supernova Experiment, which Brenda and I are part of, which should do really great work um, on that as well. Nice. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry. I lost my place in the questions. Here we go. Next one. Do we have conclusive evidence that quasars have a black hole in their center, or is that still to be shown? I think as conclusive as we can be without going there and touching it ourselves, because there's very few, there are very few physical mechanisms that we know of that can explain that. I think that plot I was showing with the really high amount of light being emitted at these, the X-ray and UV um, wavelengths just can't be explained with fusion of atoms, like, like what happens in stars. And there are other processes like merging neutron stars can emit really, really high, um, high energy radiation, but those don't last for as long. So when we see something emitting at that high of energy for that duration, I think the only, we're able to rule out most others. And the only plausible thing that can produce that sort of radiation is accretion onto a supermassive black hole. Hmm. All right, one more question or many more, but this is the next one. <laughs> what type of telescope data gives you the data? Visual, radio, and a note, this is from Brett Dodd. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so a lot of people are looking for changing the quasars in just visible light, because um, that's what we have a lot of telescopes from Earth that can see pretty well through the atmosphere in visible light. Um, and there are some in infrared that can peek through the atmosphere as well. So some searches for changing low quasars have looked in infrared, but I don't know if 
there might have been some searches in x-ray, but you have to do that with space data because x-rays fortunately don't get through our atmosphere very well. So, um, so I think there's just less data available, less of these surveys where they're just scanning the sky in wavelengths like x-ray or radio. So instead we tend to find them through visible light or infrared sometimes. Yes. Thanks dad for a great question. <laughs> okay, next, how do you approach your research on something so mysterious? I think that's what makes research so exciting for me. And Alex, I know you work on a similar similar topic. You work on a very mysterious thing. <laughs> so I don't know if you feel similarly, but having having that big mystery, although sometimes it feels daunting, but I think that's what an excellent advisor is for. And I'm very lucky my advisor. Enrico is good at breaking, breaking down the mystery into things that we can actually test and um, making it manageable. So, so I guess the mystery is what makes it exciting for me. And then having an advisor who's great at helping you have somewhere to start is what makes it doable. Nice. And next, are changing the quasar, quasars on average farther than regular quasars? That's a good question. I think, I, I think that we don't know because part of how we detect the changing the quasars is based on changes in their brightness. And it's a lot easier when a quasar is closer to have a clear signal like, okay, it changed by this much and our error is pretty low. But the further away that the quasar is, it's much more difficult to know conclusively because again, the error bars go up that the variation we're seeing is, is real. So that's a really great question. I don't know if they're more likely to happen because when you're looking further in space, you're looking back in time. So I don't, I don't know that, I think they would honestly happen more often around redshift two. So back, back in our history, but we haven't been able to find very many at high redshifts just because of that problem with the errors being larger. And then one last question for you from Hannah. Do changing look quasars vanish faster than regular quasars? And they also say, thanks for teaching us about quasars. Oh, hi, Hannah. <laughs> um, that's a good question too. Yeah, I think so. So we haven't, I haven't looked a lot at data of quasars fading, but they tend to, it tends to be a little bit of a sputtering down process where we, we see it happening um, over time and it's not as drastic. So I don't have a good like numeric estimate of how, how much different the time is, but it's definitely, we would expect it to be slower than we see it. So that's part of the mystery is we don't know how the matter from that big accretion disc can funnel inwards in such a short amount of time. And then, okay, one more question. <laughs> what is the time scale for the variation in brightness? for the changing load quasars? It depends. Um, I'm sure that people are discovering more and maybe over longer timescales as we have more observations, but a lot of the ones that I used in my recent research were something like months or years. Hmm. So pretty fast for astronomy at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we're like, oh, it's so fast, 10 million years. That's funny. Wow, well, really, again, really great questions and really great answers. <laughs> wow, so happy to have had you on tonight. You did such a wonderful job. Really great feedback from your audience. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for being a delightful host. Oh, it's all you all. No. <laughs> all right, well, thank you again, Sierra, and hope to have you back sometime soon. Okay, and I think we're ready for the answers to our quiz or the trivia. And I am happy to announce that there was a three-way tie for, um, yeah, for, I guess, first place, all of which, all three of these people got perfect scores. Um, and then a special shout out to Dirk, Sierra's brother, who came in second. 
Okay, but I'll, I'll name the winners at the end. So let me share the screen and show you all the answers to this quiz. And here we are. So for number one, December 25th, which apple loving or hating physicist was born on this day in 1642? And this answer was Isaac Newton, Mr. Gravity Man. So good job if you got that or good job if you didn't get it, you know, A for effort. And number two, December 25th on this day, in 1758, the first predicted observation of a comet was recorded. Name that comet. That was Halley's Comet. Haley, Halley. I'm gonna say Haley. <laughs> so, very nice. And number three, December 25th. Here's looking at you, kid. Which Hollywood star was born on this day in 1899? And the answer to this was Humphrey Bogart. I hope someone can tell me where this quote is from and tell me how to say it correctly because I'm, I'm sure my delivery is totally incorrect. <laughs> so, all right. So that was D Humphrey Bogart. Next question, star of wonder, star of light, star with royal beauty bright, the star of Bethlehem may very well be an actual astronomical event in history. What could it be? And the answer to this was supernova. Okay, I was just informed from Anne that the last um, slide was a reference to Casablanca. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> okay, so the answer to this one is supernova. So probably a very bright nearby exploding star. Very cool. Okay, now astronomy in the news. The fifth moon of which planet was discovered by Lick Observatory? And that was Jupiter. Wow, that's pretty cool. And we know that Galileo um, discovered the first four, right? Okay. Number six, which radio telescope catastrophically collapsed on Tuesday? And that was Arecibo. Yeah, that was really sad. There were so many people on Twitter posting all of these stories about their experiences at Arecibo and their connections to it and all this sort of stuff. So really, really, um, sad about its its collapse okay this message was written by carl sagan to tell aliens about who we are encoded in binary and sent by the telescope in the previous question where was it sent and that is a nearby star cluster what a beautiful message all right and on to black holes. How can black holes grow? And the answers to this were B and D, merging with other black holes and accreting surrounding mass. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. What does TDE stand for in astronomy? Unfortunately, not Top Dog Entertainment, but it is titled Disruption Event. And true or false, the, a smaller black hole produces a longer light flare during a tidal disruption event than a larger black hole, and that is false. It is the opposite. The larger black hole will produce a longer light flare. All right, and what's the primary process that allows for mass orbiting a black hole in an accretion disk to fall onto the black hole. And that was A, loss of energy through friction. 
And that is it. So our three-way tie for first place were Lucy, Hannah, and Dina. So congratulations to the three of you on perfect scores. Apparently the creators of this quiz thought it was much harder, but, or maybe you guys just, you all really, uh, you know your stuff. So congratulations to the three of you. And I hear that Lucy is Brenna's mom's best friend. So lots of family and, and friends of family and everything joining in tonight. We really appreciate you all uh, coming through and joining us. That's really um, one exciting thing about these um, online streams is that people who normally wouldn't be able to join us for these events are able to tune in and see their, their children or their friends' children or whomever give these really awesome talks and, and do some really cool things um, and join us and learn and, you know, have a, a sip of some alcoholic or non-alcoholic drink, relax on a nice Thursday evening. So very, very cool. Um, one reminder, there is no show in January. So we'll uh, be back to you all with new shows, new speakers, new content uh, um, in February of 2021. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. We really hope that you'll you'll keep coming back every month to learn some more, uh, join in, in fellowship. Although I can't see you all, I know you all are having a great time <laughs> at home. And we really hope that soon we can, we can go back to, to seeing you all in person. So again, no show in January. We'll see you in February. Thank you so much to all of the people that joined us this evening, Sierra, Brenna, and Da, and um, sorry, <laughs> Sierra, Brenna, um, and Bob. It was really wonderful having you all on this evening, um, learning some really awesome things about black holes and also learning more about the, the, the wildfire relief efforts that are happening through Friends of Lick Observatory um, in support of those on Mount Hamilton. So again, thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Um, is there anything that I'm forgetting to say? I don't think so. I think that's it. <laughs> so have a good night and we'll see you next time. Happy holidays.